Hello and welcome to the RCSI University of Medicine Health Sciences. I am Professor Cahill Kelly, CEO of RCSI. This afternoon I am joined by a panel of RCSI faculty who are experts in virology and epidemiology for what I hope will be an informative and lively discussion about our experience with COVID-19 here in Ireland. I want to start, however, by acknowledging that many people have suffered greatly during this pandemic, in some cases losing loved ones. I also want to acknowledge the public health leaders, our medical professionals and the general public. Through a collective effort in Ireland, we are managing the pandemic well. With early effective restrictions on people's movements and good public health measures, our health service has not been overwhelmed. Our ICU recovery rates are amongst the best in the world. We have together flattened the curve. We now have low levels of community transmission and the decline in case numbers has been consistent over many weeks. While restrictions have eased considerably, cases of SARS-2 coronavirus have continued to decline. Something that is less often talked about is the toll this has taken on the emotional well-being of young people. Their education has been disrupted, their social connectivity which is so important to them, and their opportunities have been greatly curtailed. As a parent of three university-going young people, I'm reminded of this every day. As a parent, I also worry more about their physical health and the risks they take more than they do. For every family, it is a balance of weighing the impact of curtailing the education and development of their young people against the risks of moving out into the community to move forward with their lives. From an institutional perspective, we at RCSI are also balancing several imperatives. Our duty to the public in training tomorrow's essential healthcare professionals, our responsibility to our students to allow them continue on their vocational journey in which they have invested so much time, passion and effort, the moral imperative of continuing with our crucial healthcare research, all with the absolute priority of keeping our students and staff safe. The most important element in staying safe is for each of us to take personal responsibility and precautions around social distancing, facial coverings, hand and respiratory hygiene. I can guarantee you that RCSI will do everything in its power to create the safest possible campus environment and will support our students as we would wish our own children to be treated under similar circumstances. We at RCSI also have been taking the advice of our academic experts to ensure that at every step of the way, as we prepare for the next academic year, we keep you, our students, and our staff safe. Although RCSI will look a little different as we all adapt to the new normal, I would like to reassure you that we are putting in place all necessary health and safety measures to protect you, while also ensuring the quality of your educational experience is not in any way compromised by these precautions. I'm joined today by Professor Sam McConkey, Associate Professor and Head of the Department of International Health and Tropical Medicine at RCSI, Dr. Fidelma Fitzpatrick, Senior Lecturer and Consultant Microbiologist at RCSI and Beaumont Hospital in Dublin, Professor Ruri Brewer, Professor Emeritus of the Department of Public Health and Epidemiology at RCSI, and finally Professor Jared Curley, Professor of Anesthesia and Critical Care at RCSI and Consultant in Anesthesia and Intensive Care Medicine at Beaumont Hospital. Sam, as a student of international health systems, how would you characterise Ireland's response to the COVID-19 crisis, particularly comparing it to other international health systems? I think um, in general we've done very well. Uh, we uh, saw it coming. Our first meeting of our national public health emergency team was in January. Uh, unfortunately, our leaders listened to the national public health emergency team uh, staff and implemented uh, lots of public health measures early. The most dramatic was coming up to our national holiday, St. Patrick's Day, about a week before it, they basically said, no, we're, we're, we're cancelling St. Patrick's Day. And that's a worldwide international celebration of Irish culture that we all enjoy and, and participate in all, all over the world. So that, that was cancelled. Then a few days later, they closed the pubs, closed schools, and closed down a lot of non-essential Irish businesses. Uh, we still had many people traveling into our country, so we still had a lot of sick people, and many of us worked extremely hard 
uh, to reorganize our hospital, to retrain staff that were maybe doing non-essential things. A lot of elective surgery stopped and we changed our hospital to two separate services, one for COVID-19 and one for non-COVID services. We scaled up testing dramatically and had rapid testing available so we could see which pathway people should be on. And then within about three, four weeks, our numbers started to plateau and come down. And thankfully now, and since, since May, we've had very, very low number of cases, maybe in around the number of new cases per day of something like one in a million of new unexplained community transmission cases. So I'm really relieved. And thankfully now our hospital is still looking after the people who got it two, three months ago, but thankfully we're not seeing hardly any new severe cases of COVID-19. So I, I, I feel in Ireland, much relieved that we've, we've got here and sadly our friends in UK and uh, folk in the US where we often benchmark ourselves against we've had uh, much better control in both those countries probably now about tenfold less cases than UK and on front of the US about 40 states it's rapidly increasing right now uh, they're they're on a trajectory unfortunately to, to, to getting worse over the next few weeks whereas we're, we've been gradually improving so I'm, I'm relieved whereas I was very very anxious and tense about this in February and March uh, RCSI's main teaching hospital, Beaumont Hospital, was the busiest hospital in the state during the COVID crisis. And I know many people watching this will aspire to a career in medicine, much like you, Fidelma, as a clinical microbiologist. What was it like to work during the heat of this crisis as a microbiologist in our hospital? Um, fascinating, exhilarating and stressful all at the same time. So it was an absolute privilege to be able to go to work where most of the population had to stay at home. Um, I had to get very used to reading literature late at night, changing decisions we made one day the following day based on the latest um, evidence, um, working with everybody because part of the job of a microbiologist is you go from the laboratory to patients, to the hospital auxiliary services. Um, so I was involved with a core team of, as Sam said, we redesigned the entire hospital. So if you walked into Beaumont specifically in March and April, it was unrecognizable. Um, first of all, we were all unrecognizable. We wore scrubs. I was trying to be a surgeon. Um, but also um, it was very much a, an incredible atmosphere, even though we were all really stressed. Everybody was pointing the one direction. Um, decisions were made fast. Um, everybody ran with it. And yet we made a decision on a Monday knowing we might have to change it on a Tuesday. So I must say I was very proud of everybody that I worked with. Um, we worked together. We worked very hard. The laboratory has done over 11,000 tests. We did our first test on the 16th of March. We're providing a service to our nursing homes, to one of our direct provision services. So I'm, I'm very proud of what we've achieved though of course I'm not keeping taking my eye off the ball. And Jair as director of intensive care unit in Beaumont Hospital you were right at the centre of it all. Mm -hmm. uh, did you ever in your career think you'd experience anything like this? No I didn't and I have to say that it was uh, a very anxious time, it was a stressful time and mm -hmm. um, we didn't know what we were facing into. We didn't know would we have enough ventilators, would we have enough staff, would we have enough beds for the patients that were going to present with respiratory failure. Um, but what countered that was, was teamwork and I'm enormously grateful that we have such highly trained um, professionals uh, in our hospitals and we saw over 500 patients in the hospital. We had um, about 10% of those patients presented to the intensive care unit and our, our mortality in the ICU um, is about 10%. And I think those really good outcomes that we have had are down to that, that teamwork. Um, we had such good teamwork that Fidelma and Sam have outlined. We instituted pathways for the, the care of these patients. Um, we had time to prepare and I'm grateful for that as well. Um, but there was enormous professionalism. There was a, a huge number of specialties that, that stepped up that were, would not normally be involved in the care of patients in an intensive care unit. We had surgeons, we had anaesthetists, we had um, physicians from outside of the cores of, of uh, respiratory and, and infectious diseases and clinical microbiology who were there, organized into teams caring for these patients in the ICU. 
I, I would say it's, it's emotional, emotionally draining, emotionally traumatic when you have young patients who are presenting who are severely ill and who, uh, some of whom uh, unfortunately passed away. Um, however, I think through teamwork and through professionalism, we got through it and we had good outcomes. Yeah. And Rory, I think Ireland and our public and our healthcare professions can take great pride in flattening the curve. I suppose the question on everyone's lips is, will we experience a second curve? I sort of smile when I hear that the term um, epidemiological concepts have sort of dominated our, our airwaves since early March. And we hear the flattening the curve or better crushing the curve, the reproductive number or now the second wave uh, as if you know, it's a tsunami that's going to uh, sort of roll over us. When in fact, it, these terms are a bit deceptive because really what they are is uh, there are outbreaks uh, uh, and, and, and they aggregate if there are sufficient numbers of them that we see these big waves. I actually think uh, a, a, a better way of understanding them is, is uh, the infection is to think of uh, uh, bushfires, uh, the, the burning embers. What you need for the second wave to call it that is a unique circulating virus uh, and that can come in two ways our failure to eliminate the virus from the community and there's no doubt that we have we're in a very good place because the, the numbers are, are, are right down we're among the lowest now now in Europe but we know that uh, there is a virus out there which is not presenting particularly as we see the distribution and the infection uh, the age distribution now has gone back towards the younger group who are either, some of them are asymptomatic and others that just don't feel that ill with it. And maybe they've picked it up, uh, they've been at a house party or a beach party and there's definitely a circulating virus. The second way is of course, we're now importing new cases and we can see already our politicians are beginning to listen. Just today now, it's more or less been announced we're gonna postpone uh, opening up these channels for people to travel abroad. So they're at the burning embers, but what really gets it uh, going, if you remember the bushfires in Australia, is, is the wind, the accelerant. And the accelerant will be people's behaviour and particular settings that are very conducive to it. And, and Rory, the secret to this is to test, trace and isolate. Do you have confidence as we prepare for the autumn that o Ireland has put in place sufficient resources to protect us in that domain? I think, as Sam said, I think we've actually done everything right. We, we were maybe just a little bit slow off the ground, uh, but I think when we compare with our neighbours, with the UK, we, we, we have put the systems in place. We have what's a capacity of 15,000 tests a day. The, the under, there was a lot of feedback about how slow the, the testing, getting the results back, the contact tracing, but that's all been got down to quite a short space of time. But we have to do both the prevention and it's the simple messages again, it's the, the, uh, the, the distancing, the, the hand uh, and, and face hygiene. We have to get the prevention right um, so as not to overstretch that testing, tracing, ice, isolation capacity. It's there, but we, this is, there's no one single, uh, everything has to be right and in place and working. And Sam, RCSI is transitioning to a new normal. What's that experience going to be like for our new and returning students? So it, Ireland uh, perhaps is one of the very, very few countries in the world that has kept our borders open so people can travel for emergency travel or for travel that they feel is essential uh, if they need to both in and out of our country. The way that we've controlled uh, the preventing new infections coming into Ireland is by 14 days of mandatory self-isolation when people come in. So students coming in, and RCSI students are included in this, may well have to stay in the room uh, without circulating in the general public or with others for 14 days when they arrive in. That's our current uh, restrictions in Ireland. That might change. It might become a slightly shorter period, or it may be that some testing uh, is, is mandatory by the government to, to, to shorten that period. Uh, so, so I think Ireland ha is accessible and remains accessible and because we're a small island nation and we love to travel and, and travel a lot and have a very open economy. I believe that commitment to open travel will, will continue with open airports and open airlines. 
within our CSI uh, physical uh, campus and within our teaching, we obviously moved to online teaching for a lot of our teaching in uh, March, April, May, and uh, many of us have done lots of online teaching over previous years and we're able to amend that and use that. We're really hoping in September to do a lot of teaching face to face in large lecture theatres like this one in a socially distanced way. So we're all practicing uh, cough etiquette, respiratory etiquette. We're, we're, not, we're, we're coughing into tissues rather than coughing into our, our neighbors' faces. And uh, similarly, if, if any students or staff have symptoms uh, in fact, anyone in Ireland has symptoms, then it's rapidly easy to, to get access to primary care and to get tests done to see have they got COVID-19. And those folk with symptoms of fever and cough really have to stay at home and are really strongly encouraged not to come to class. Uh, we, we, within RCSI, have a record system of who's together in classes with others. So that would make contact tracing very easily, though we, we hope that won't be necessary. We also have spaced out our lecture theatres so students are a couple of metres separated from other students and in smaller units than they would have been before. Similarly, our movements through the building have been directed and changed so we don't have large numbers of students congregating together. So I'm hoping students will have a social life, but unfortunately it will be different from the social life they had before, probably in smaller groups of, of, of three or five students, uh, sticking a bit with the same group of students, uh, stick, sticking within those groups perhaps for uh, entertainment as well as for tuition uh, and, and not maybe meeting in large groups uh, and if there are large groups they would have to be spaced out in, in a very large building so there definitely will be changes. Lots of hand sanitizers available, uh, lots, lots of tissues and lots of hand washing facilities available. And, and Fidelma, as a committed medical educator, what do you, how do you think the COVID-19 experience will impact on our healthcare system and indeed health care education? I, it's, it's a hard one to call because you, you really can't foresee the future, but certainly it's changed all our perceptions of infection control, epidemiology, microbiology, infectious diseases, ICU, respiratory medicine. We've now lived a lot of what we've been teaching. But before I answer that question, I just wanted to pick up, if I may, on the issue of personal responsibility, because I think this is a really good opportunity for future doctors, doctors to model actually what they're going to spend the rest of their life doing. So did I really want to be in Beaumont at 11 o'clock at night all the time? I didn't. Did I want to not see my parents or not see my sisters and children? Of course I did. But I, in a way, had to model the advice I wanted to give everybody else. So as a medical student, I think it's really important that everybody takes personal responsibility, knows that if you've been unwell or if you've been a close contact, you don't come into college wearing masks, hand hygiene, distancing, and also limiting the bubble of people you hang out with. Um, and if everybody does something, then as Rory said, then we're gonna control this. But it's not just about testing or just about masks, it's the whole package. So I think this is an ideal opportunity for each individual to practice what they're gonna spend their life doing. So yes, our hospitals will look different, but actually if you walked into Beaumont, Apart from us wearing scrubs and all, all wearing masks, Bowman's back up to normal. Um, we're, we are at full capacity. Our emergency department is seeing the same rate of patients as it did last year. Surgery's working. Our ICUs are thankfully back to non-COVID patients. Um, but of course, we're all concerned that things could easily, the, the, the fires could easily be lit again. So, you know, I think by, you know, healthcare has transformed, but we are back to normal. But we are still, I suppose, scarred by what we've seen. And we're very, most people that have been around Beaumont in March and April don't want to go back there. And I don't think we will. But I think from an education end of things, I think if each student takes personal responsibility and does four or five things every single day and if everybody does that mm -hmm. then you can help control the infection. And Ger, as a leading clinician scientist has COVID-19 changed the direction of your research? Certainly um, mm -hmm. it has accelerated the drive to uh, to find a, a treatment for acute respiratory distress syndrome um, it has uh, it has changed the the focus in, in intensive care units um, such that we want every patient to be participating in 
uh, a research study now, whether that is an observational research study, whether that is uh, just taking blood to look at an inflammatory response, or actual participation in a, in a clinical trial of a, a potential therapy. Um, so I, I think that um, we, uh, it, it has provided us, I suppose, with an opportunity to understand um, acute respiratory distress syndrome um, uh, much better. Now we have a worldwide focus on a single disease. Mm. And it's interesting what a worldwide focus on a disease that causes a lot of distress and a lot of death uh, in our intensive care units. We've advanced hugely in a short period of time from this singular focus on, on one disease. I think I'd echo what uh, Fadama has said. There's an enormous amount to learn from the pandemic as a whole um, from a medical student perspective. Um, there is the socioeconomic disparity in how uh, patients have been affected uh, and in terms of, of mortality. And these socioeconomic disparities are, are prevalent in healthcare as a whole. Um, there uh, is um, uh, also the, the uh, professionalism, uh, I, I think, again, that Fidelma mentioned, is uh, really important because professionalism really is the thing that defeated uh, or brought the, the virus under control in our hospital. Professionalism whereby we have doctors uh, stepping up and doing their job, going above and beyond, really, what uh, they would be required in the normal course of events. Um, and and this, this, these high levels of professionalism are what, um, for, for me, made it much easier to work in, in an environment that was, that was hugely challenging. I, I think the other thing in terms of healthcare education that um, is, is uh, going to change is it's going to ex accelerate changes that have been afoot for the last decade. So migrating content um, online, which we have been a little bit resistant towards in some quarters, uh, we've had to do that very quickly. Um, and we've had to use technology enhanced learning for uh, for simulation, even for clinical skills, things that we would have balked at previously, we've been forced to embrace, and now we will evaluate for for benefit and and uh, to see whether they they really have a place in in terms of medical education. RCSI's response to COVID was at all times informed by our highly experienced faculty, such as my colleagues on today's panel. Since late January, sometime before its full impact was clear to all, we worked on the basis that our priority was first to ensure that our medical and other professional graduates would be able to finish their programmes and graduate on time. We brought examinations forward and accelerated the programme, allowing our graduates to join the workforce, not just on schedule, but a month earlier than normal. We, in parallel, moved as much of our programme as possible online, to facilitate more junior classes and run high stakes proctor end of year exams online as well. When these plans were in place in March, we established cross institutional working groups to address the coming academic year and focus on looking after the health and well being of our students, including a robust in house prevention program, contact tracing, and testing facilities. We have another team redesigning our campus to facilitate socially distant education. A further team are upskilling our expertise on engaging digital learning as true digital pedagogy is more than moving existing processes online. We have accelerated existing plans to divide classes into smaller learning communities to significantly increase our small group teaching. Another group are looking with our student union at ensuring an exciting and safe social and sporting program for all our students. All the year heads are working with their teams in making sure all our students enjoy a truly engaging, interactive and stretching academic program, both on campus and through our digital platforms. We all know that what makes a great doctor is great clinical training. We've thought carefully about this and we have developed teaching methodologies that maintain or acknowledge excellence in clinical skills, patient history and examination in particular. While clinical training against the background of COVID-19 is challenging, 
we do need to train doctors to the new reality of clinical practice in the 21st century, a century where it's likely that there will be more battles to be fought against pandemics and communicable diseases will be a reality of clinical practice. And, and Sam, as a long-time vaccine researcher and a member of the European Vaccine Consortium, are we likely to develop a vaccine? So uh, that's, it's, it's a, a difficult question to predict the future, Carl. I, I think, um, as I've said before, that the average time for a human vaccine uh, to de be developed after there's a commitment to do it is, is, has historically been about seven years. Now, it is the case that for coronavirus, SARS-2, there's been more effort and more money and more investment of resources in developing a vaccine for this than anything else in the past. Uh, there is a, an existing vaccine uh, for a pig coronavirus. The other typical coronaviruses in, in humans, up now the six others, we, we don't have definitive uh, vaccines for them. And unfortunately for the four commonly circulating ones, the immunity that people get from having the other coronaviruses is, is partial and it only lasts for a few months, three to 12 months. So you don't get lifelong immunity from having other coronaviruses. So I suspect, unfortunately, that any vaccine that does come up will be partial and will be temporary and may need to be repeated, as of course we already do with influenza. Um, so I would say there's huge effort and uh, amount of research, both private and public sector, all over the world going into this and uh, approximately 130 vaccine candidates at present. Uh, so uh, we, we're involved in seeking funding for some phase two trials and phase three trials and staff for those. And if I can open it to the floor, what other treatment options seem hopeful to any of you uh, from your own research and, uh, and study of the literature? Well, I've mainly focused on prevention and back to basics because there's been lots of, and I'm sure Ger will talk about some of the treatments from ICU, but I think a lot of the focus on the next magic bullet um, forgets about prevention is better than cure. Mm -hmm. So there still is unknowns though, even in the prevention, like how is it spread? So, you know, conventional wisdom would say that droplets are big particles and it's droplet. So ergo, it'll, you know, land within two meters and aerosols are small particles and they're going to fly for miles and that this is droplet spread. But we've all seen in, in our experience of this infection, it's not quite that simplistic. Bugs don't behave like that. Um, so I think there has to be, there's still an unknown, is there a certain amount of aerosol transmission in this? Hand hygiene clearly is um, the, the most important way to prevent any infection, but there's the research into why we don't do hand hygiene when we should, and it's not just in a healthcare setting, even the issue of mask wearing. I went, came in on the bus as a committed bus user today, and I did give daggers looks to people not wearing masks, because it only works if we're all wearing masks. Um, but again, there's that message to get that out, that if I wear a mask, I'm protecting you. I'm actually not protecting myself. If you don't wear a mask, you're not protecting me. So we all need to wear masks. So certainly in prevention, it, it, it's a lot of the research will be around actually getting us to do what we should do. Because sometimes it is hard, as Rory said, you know, you go out with your friends and you might have a drink or two and common sense goes out. So we'll, ha we'll all have to change our behavior. So I, I would make a plea that prevention is key. And yes, there's lot, there will be magic bullets, but let's, not, let's stop people getting this in the first place. And at the same time, of course, do research into the magic bu bullets and the vaccine. Like it's, I think this whole thing has been fascinating. Like we're probably all on to Twitter and I've I've used Twitter as a medical education tool because there's some very good people I follow that actually have nothing else to do clearly but read papers and post summaries but it's been incredible the speed of the literature you literally can't keep up with it um, so th like this as I said to you this has just been totally unprecedented and, and Jer is an intensivist what do you rest most hope on? Antivirals, uh, moderating the immune response? So I, I, I think that the journey, and it's been a short one so far, has been really interesting because at the very beginning, um, we had a, a focus on antivirals, on single cytokine therapies. Mm -hmm. um, and what we've learned in a very short space of time is Sure, there may be some benefit from antivirals, remdesivir in particular, but that benefit in patients who are critically ill is marginal or very, very small. Um, 
there's uh, been more of a focus uh, recently on steroids um, and uh, dexamethasone in particular and a large uh, study uh, sponsored by uh, uh, the uh, Oxford in the UK um, with thousands of patients has demonstrated a mortality benefit from a uh, cheap and widely available uh, steroid uh, called dexamethasone. Now that paper has to be published and it, that literature has to be really carefully evaluated. Mm -hmm. And I can't emphasize that enough. Um, we saw with hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine um, where research that was uh, put out there too quickly without proper peer review um, actually has uh, ended up sending the wrong message, the wrong story, the, uh, the uh, improper conclusion has been drawn. So it's, it's, it's early days, steroids are a possibility. Um, we ourselves at RCSI have been uh, studying a uh, naturally occurring protein called alpha-1 antitrypsin um, that in inhibits viral entry into the um, uh, endothelial cells or, or, or other cells um, and also is able to modulate the immune response. And I think that in the initial stages, before we have a, a, an effective vaccine, that it is immune modulators that are going to make a difference. It's choosing the right immune modulator. And in choosing the right Im immune modulator, we've got to understand the disease. So we spent the first number of months trying to understand the disease a little bit better. In the early stages, we thought we had this huge cytokine storm that was the problem. And now after weeks and months, we've realized it's not really uh, uh, the cytokine storm that is the problem. Um, it's a prolonged critical illness. Um, it is microthrombi uh, in, in organs um, and multi-organ failure, which is very similar to the pathophysiology that we see with acute respiratory distress syndrome. And we spent decades trying to find a therapy for that. Um, I, I, I certainly believe that a singular focus in the world on finding a solution from an immune modulation point of view will yield a therapy to reduce the, the complications and the mortality in, the inten in intensive care. Uh, Rory, this is an unprecedented event in our lifetime. We reference back to the Spanish flu of 1918. Uh, with your wider perspective, what have we learned from this pandemic? Well, it's interesting you refer to the Spanish flu. I, I decided to look back a little, little bit further um, on the basis that um, th those who don't uh, learn from history are doomed to repeat it. It was Santiana, actually, who originally said that. Um, it's clear that the, the, the countries of Southeast Asia, they learn from the experience of, of SARS-1, uh, which, which we hadn't uh, experienced, and they responded very quickly. But actually, the European history is there, and, and, and the lessons were there from the time of Venice, of the, the, the 14th and 15th century. Quarantine was uh, from the Venetian word quarantino, the 40 days that the ship had to be kept out of the harbor uh, in case it was going to bring in the, uh, the bubonic plague. And it's ironic in a way that Italy was the first country to be affected uh, in, in Europe. Um, so the question is, uh, can we uh, learn from history and can we learn from others? And I think in Ireland, actually, we have been fortunate. We've been about three weeks behind, which is a long time in an epidemic. And we have been learning uh, the lessons from other countries. Now, we in Ireland, actually, in, th in the first wave, we were quite fortunate in a way. I say we out in the community because the epidemic really hit the hospitals and it hit the, the, the nursing homes. Uh, in, in, and, and, and a higher proportion of, of the infections in Ireland were in those two settings. So the question now is, can, can we learn uh, from other countries who've experienced a community uh, epidemic? And I think listening to Fidelma there, the, it's the prevention paradox. Mm. Um, so now we, we have to see, can, can we learn from that? Uh, um, history tells us one, teaches one thing. Uh, culture uh, is a big issue. And in Southeast Asia, they, they uh, are much more buying into social control than we are in Ireland. And we're aware of some of the, the successes. The big success actually in, in Southeast Asia, it wasn't Singapore or Hong Kong or Korea or Taiwan. It was uh, Vietnam, a country of 100 million people had no deaths. 
because they responded very quickly. Now, now we, we also responded quite quickly in Ireland. Uh, they, they, they put travel controls in place, they put quarantines in place. They did it from mid-January to the end of January. So I think as long as we have the political leadership, we've had the public health leadership, the two have worked closely together. I think it's a new challenge now with the second wave because uh, it's going to be much more of a community epidemic. And if I can put it to the floor again, I guess the question in everybody's lips is how do they move forward? You know, what advice do you give to a young person who's gone through a number of months of stay at home orders? Now there's a relaxing of restrictions. How should they face into the coming year? Yeah, I think at least in Ireland, we're very fortunate in that large parts of our economy are, are doing reasonably well. The, the hardware, computer hardware, computer software, pharmaceuticals, agriculture, supermarkets, healthcare, and financial services, banks, insurance are, are actually doing well. And our, our economic uh, sort of tax receipts at national level have su stayed surprisingly good through this. There are a lot of uh, people in the tourist industry, in, in bars and restaurants and airlines that, that are struggling and are unemployed. And they're gradually starting to get back into employment. So I, I feel we have social cohesion here and we have buy-in from a large group of the population. Uh, so so I, I think that we'll have the economic stability and political stability here to, to weather this through for the next three or five years without, you know, tearing ourselves apart. For young people, I think it's a matter of, of rather than having uh, large parties with 50 and 200 people in large groups. It's a matter of having uh, a regular group of five or ten people that you enjoy going out with, uh, the si with the same group again and again and getting involved in aspects of like, like, like music, uh, like dancing, like art, like sports. And those are opening up again uh, for those smaller groups of, of you know, up to, up to 20 people. Mm -hmm. so, so I think we have to almost shrink our social networks, not to one anymore, but to manageable groups mm -hmm. like, like 10 or 20 and try and avoid large crowded places where people are squashed together and that unfortunately I see as being the, the new normal un until we have vaccines or small molecules that prevent it. And many young people are asking themselves questions about whether they should embark on their university education at this time, whether they should return to high school etc. As medical experts, knowing what you know, what is your advice to them? Well, I think it's very safe to do so. I think the, the way we're doing it here uh, will protect the students from uh, catching disease or, or suffering from it. And I think it's very clear that in a year's time and five years' time, the world will need uh, nurses and doctors and pharmacists and physiotherapists mm -hmm. and occupational therapists even more so than they did a year ago. So there still is a real need. It's a very satisfying career. And those of us you know, who are right in the middle of it we certainly worked very hard and you know, felt tired and exhausted and, and, and frightened, I'd say, at times. And there was a need for clear leadership uh, of, 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 of the juniors from those of us who are senior. But, but we, we got through it and got through it successfully. And you know, we've, got, we've done it once in, in April and March, so we could do that again, even though we, we wouldn't want to. So I think for healthcare institutions, there's a real positivity. If you want to go and drive a, a cruise liner ship uh, I'm not sure that that's a good career right now. So I think you have to pick your career into something where there will be jobs. Mm -hmm. And certainly healthcare is, is, is definitely going to be in big demand for staff. Mm. But, but also the community transmission is, is low at the moment. So, you know, it's back to kind of the prevention, you know. So thankfully in Ireland, by us all working together with political support and actually superb leadership from doctors, community transmission is low. Now it hasn't gone away, but it is low. Um, so apart from the fact I'm traumatised that I'm not a young person anymore, but I'll get over it. Um, you know, look, at, I'm back in work. Um, I have expanded my social bubble that was a little bit small for a while and I'm now seeing my friends. I started off seeing them outside. Now last weekend I saw two friends of part of my bubble so I've choose your bubble wisely basically. <laughs> but you know look at, at the end of the day life does go on but it's slightly changed. So if community transmission is low um, it spreads, we know how it spreads, we know what to do, come back to college um, get involved, lead. And, you know, as Sam said, you know, it, it, it's, it's been an absolute privilege of somewhat exhausting at times to be a doctor. Like I've learned so much um, and I've learned a lot about 
some colleagues in Beaumont I didn't actually know very well and I now have new friendships because of our long days and the way we all pull together. So at the moment with the current epidemiology I wouldn't have a problem. I'm here in Ireland but I wouldn't have a problem going back to Ireland but I would need to do certain things including washing my hands, physical distancing and wearing a mask in the bus and you know when you come to college as well because as Rory said we do know a certain amount of people are asymptomatic. Clearly if somebody's coughing that's the red light, stay away but not the significant proportion of people don't have symptoms and yet have the virus and could potentially spread it be it pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic. So you you know, we just get on with it really and do what we should do. And Rory is a distinguished emeritus professor of epidemiology who began your career working in a mission hospital in Africa, who studied many such similar public health crises. What's your advice to a young person embarking on a career in medicine? It's, I think this pandemic has really made us see how, how healthcare and medicine is global. Um, uh, I think I've been described as the professor of Emirates. I wonder will I get free, free <laughs> airline uh, tickets. But um, since I thought I had retired, actually most every week I've been doing a webinar uh, on COVID uh, uh, as it affects low and middle income countries. Uh, and I think we're a very global uh, U University of Health Sciences here. And uh, I think I, I've really seen the global dimension of this pa pandemic and how context really determines it. I mean, we, we have a, we've had a particular type of uh, epidemic here in Ireland, but the solutions that uh, apply, say, in Africa are, are, are somewhat different. Uh, and and it, it's taught me that um, we, we should really get to know our context, our culture, the politics, the strengths and the weaknesses uh, of our country. And, and, and Africa has actually learnt uh, that. And, and some countries, are they're not locking down uh, so severely. Um, I, I, I think uh, I, I, we're very fortunate in Ireland that we're, we're on an island. I would say to any student who is uh, thinking of embarking on, on their medical career here, this is a very good place to do it. Um, if necessary, we will be able to uh, introduce the quarantines, uh, you know, cl close, close the borders if we need to. But, but all, the, all the lesson learning can be done here. All the opportunities uh, to learn, not just about uh, COVID, but, but uh, you know, listening to um, uh, Fidel Manjur saying how normal, normal practice is, 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 is returning here. I think this is a, a great time to be doing medicine actually, and a great place, great opportunities to learn. I must say, I often think one of the great strengths of Irish medical education this proximity to senior clinical decision makers and can I say it it's been a real privilege to observe all of you in action you've been advising our government you've taken a leading role in advising the general public and coordinating our public's response which has been so successful and you've been extraordinary professionals in your care and commitment to the care of patients in some of the busiest hospitals of the state so can I end this uh, discussion by thanking you sincerely it, it is an honor to work alongside you. Thank you. My thanks to our guest speakers who joined us today, Professor Sam McConkie, Dr. Fidelma Fitzpatrick, Professor Rory Brewer, and Professor Jared Curley. I am proud to be a graduate and now lead this university. Today you've heard from four members of our world-class faculty. Across the university, our academic and professional staff are working tirelessly to ensure that we can provide you with an exceptional educational experience in a safe environment and to help you to navigate this next phase of your life in a positive and safe way. As countries around the world open up their economies again, the issue of international travel and so-called green corridors between countries with low disease rates is more and more discussed. Ireland is an important airline travel hub for all the major US, European, Middle Eastern and Asian airlines. We have never banned international travel. We do ask travellers to self-isolate for two weeks upon arrival. This may ease, but we at RCSI will support our students with an engaged induction, education and social programme for this two weeks of self-isolation. We will be encouraging students to spend this time in small groups, or as we call them, family pods, mindful of the need for both their physical safety 
but also their psychological well-being. We will be making COVID testing available to all our students shortly after arrival, as they require. For our new students, we are encouraging RCSI supervised accommodation, mindful of their inexperience of Ireland and college life. We've produced a very comprehensive booklet that gives details of all the measures we're putting in place for all students to keep you safe and well. And this is now available on your Moodle pages. Some students are concerned that their own countries will not allow them to travel. My own sense is that countries will deal with surges through localised lockdowns or stay-at-home orders rather than general nationwide orders. If some students are prevented from attending on time, we will work with them on a case-by-case -case basis to see if we can prevent this temporary situation from impacting on their progression. I qualified in medicine from RCSI in 1985. Back then, communicable diseases did not have a significant impact on the health of our people, nor were we sufficiently aware of the psychological toll of clinical practice. And we, the medical community in general, did not give enough thought to public health. This is ironic, considering that the first academic department of public health in Britain or Ireland was established at RCSI as a chair in hygiene or political medicine in 1841 for Henry Monsell. We are waking up to a new normal where infectious or communicable diseases will be a bigger feature of clinical practice and we must prepare our next generation of doctors to practice in this world with a much greater emphasis on public or population health. At RCSI our mission is to educate nurture and discover for the benefit of human health. One of the most moving events in our academic year is our white coat ceremony. It is inspiring to see our new students take that first step in their professional transformation and to start to fulfill their ambition to become doctors and to serve. My colleagues and I are determined to make the accommodations dictated by this public health crisis to allow us to continue in our mission and support the education and training of tomorrow's doctors. I don't make light of the challenge ahead, but I do know that this will pass. In addition to preventing it from disrupting the goals and ambitions of our students, we must also learn from it. It has accelerated our plans to establish a school of population health and a centre for positive psychology and health. It's too early to speculate on the long-term impact of 2020. One hope is that, as recently quoted by Thomas Friedman, it will teach us to respect science, respect nature, and respect each other. Can I give my thanks to our panel? I think our nation owes them a great debt of gratitude for their service, and we, their colleagues at RCSI, are truly proud of their great professionalism and contribution. I thank you all for joining us today. I hope you found our discussion to be interesting. Warm greetings from RCSI in Ireland. My colleagues and I look forward to welcoming all our students to our wonderful city of Dublin in the fall.